Um, the next panel is what technologies will shape the future of warfare? For those of you that don't know me, I'm Peter Singer. We're here uh, at both organizations represented at Arizona State and New America. And um, we've got uh, online uh, major gym. Now, I can't see them, but I hopefully you can. Give me a thumbs up if you can see them there. Oh, so, um, we're going to, uh, well, we will hopefully have them at some point. Um, uh, I'm Michael. Uh, we're going to ask them to run and go tell the folks in the back that we don't have them. So, Mel, could you give them a heads up on that? Thank you. So, for those of you in the room, I'm going to go ahead and introduce a boy. Sure. Uh, who is um, uh, phenomenal, uh, PhD, uh, Chief um, Technology Forecasting Office for DEVCOM Army Research Laboratory. As I was um, explaining to the folks in the back, he's basically the point man for thinking through um, Army futures and uh, some of the key technologies that it needs um, uh, for the organization. Um, and so, uh, Troy, we're gonna use this time for um, folks in here for, um, before we go uh, with our full audience, I'm going to, instead of uh, having them stare at us, ask an unexpected question for you. Certainly. Is, um, life lesson learned. Oh, hold it. Okay. One lesson you've learned in your career. Go through your career. I think the biggest lesson that I've learned um, through, my, through my career is to embrace flexibility. I, I'd say that um, starting um, my career, I was at the bench for uh, about 10 years. I did research in a range of things from um, detection of biological threat agents to nanomaterials. Uh, to the development of novel sensors and uh, high uh, performance data processing techniques. Um, and about halfway through my career, I made the transition uh, to go more into um, science and technology advisory roles where I at one point served as the acting basic research portfolio director for the entire army and uh, leading um, the direction of science and technology and also served in some roles in, in terms of uh, technology strategy development for uh, not only the Army Research Laboratory but also uh, the whole Department of the Army. So uh, I, I think you have to really kind of embrace this ability to uh, reinvent yourself. And some of my uh, scientific heroes uh, I, I think, think of um, Folks like Linus Pauling or, or, uh, um, or to uh, a, a le perhaps lesser known but equally uh, deep uh, folks like Twan Vodin um, had the ability to be able to reinvent themselves to um, pivot into a new technical area as it presented itself to master that technical area and push that technical area to the envelope and then do it two or three times throughout their career. Um, I, I used to have a sort of a saying when early in my career that if you're working on the same thing the day you retire that you worked on the day you started, then you probably haven't really moved the technological stakes very far. That's awesome. Yeah. And um, I love you. One, uh, providing great advice to um, both the policy audience, but we've also got some students because this mm -hmm. is a joint academic, and that is um, that's pure gold uh, mm -hmm. in terms of life advice, but also for how you helped us fill a moment as we get our own <laughs> technology set. So I'm um, uh, now I see our other guests joining. Uh, hopefully they're hearing us. We've got uh, Major General Mick Ryan, a close friend, uh, who is. Um, uh, had a distinguished career um, in a variety of roles within the Australian military, including leading their defense college. Uh, he's now an adjunct fellow at Center for Strategic International Studies and um, also a author of a variety of nonfiction as well as a new fiction book, uh, his, uh, the most recent, War Transformed and Whites on War. 
And then we've got Laura Grego, uh, who is Senior Scientist and Research Director of the Global Security Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists, as well as a distinguished researcher in her own career. So thank you both uh, for joining us. Um, so I'm going to uh, begin with um, a first question. And um, why don't we uh, start off uh, with um, Laura first, uh, which is, what technology do you see as the most important but simultaneously least understood in its significance for the future? Well, uh, thanks for the invitation, Peter. I think probably many of us are, are going to include artificial intelligence as uh, the most important and least understood. Um, I think, you know, what, what we see now are the fruits of the previous generation of AI, which can do, you know, really good pattern rec recognition, make inferences, absorb large amounts of data. Um, and, uh, and, but I think, uh, and that can really be a boon, of course, it can aid in um, verification, it can provide pathways for controlling technologies. Um, some of the concerns, though, I have about it, I think um, one of the, I worry that decision makers will use AI as a decision making tool, and this may not necessarily always be better. Um, would AI have been better at predicting whether Putin was actually going to invade Ukraine when it did? I'm not sure. Um, are there things, especially in the realm of human behavior, where AI might just reproduce our own biases and cause us not to question our information sources, not to have enough skepticism? I think the other place I'm concerned about with respect to decision making is that AI will enable and reinforce our desire to move quickly and respond rapidly. Um, I, I spend most of my time thinking about nuclear issues, and that is one place I worry. Um, you know, nuclear weapons are currently postured to be launched at a moment's notice, and many of the strategic technologies increase the tempo. Um, and I worry that AI will only further increase the tempo. Um, we're starting to include maneuvering glide missiles, anti-satellite weapons, and novel long-range nuclear delivery systems, and many of them are ready to be used at a moment's notice. So I do worry that AI can increase um, confidence and compress timescales. And then, of course, the part that we don't understand is that we're, we're kind of looking at the current version of AI, um, but what can it do in the future? And um, we already see how well it can do shaping and manipulating the information environment when coupled with social media, what what, it, what will that look like in the future? I mean, even currently, we, we ha it amplifies our uh, expressions of racism, sexism, and other kinds of bigotry, and can even, social media can do that even when it's not being manipulated by AI, but um, as that becomes more useful and powerful, I'm not sure we have a great way to deal with that. So, um, those are some of the concerns and the things I think we don't understand about AI. Wow. So um, what technology do you see as in that space of most important but simultaneously least understood? Sorry, you cut out there for a moment, Peter. Was that a question for me? That was a question for you. Uh, I'm going to ask yeah. it again um, uh, because we are having tech issues. Um, uh, very appropriate to the topic. <laughs> what um, what technology do you see as most important but least understood? Um, for me, I, I would have to say it's democratized access to uh, battlefield command and control systems. I, I think there's been a lot of focus during the Ukraine war on things like autonomous systems and, and even the meshing of civil and military sensor frameworks and, and analytical capability. But I think one of the transformative elements of this war is that, at least on the Ukrainian side, they've democratized access to systems that were previously uh, secret, kept in unit uh, command posts, uh, we now have individuals that now have access to input and receive uh, location data, targeting data uh, in a way that we just haven't seen in, in previous conflicts before. Um, it kind of replicates what we've seen go on in society with the internet in the last 30 years. Now it's on the battlefield. And I think what that's doing is having a couple of impacts. Firstly, uh, it's kind of enhancing the survivability on, of people on, on one side of things, but it's also closing the detection to destruction gap that uh, is continuing to close on the battlefield. 
Um, but it also uh, closes the gap between when things happen and when people find out about them, not just on the battlefield, but in, in these things such as the strategic strike we saw in Sevastopol in the last 24 hours, we're already seeing battle damage assessment from multiple open sources. So, you know, I think that democratization of access to data uh, to people at the edge on the battlefield is, is something very new and we're really uh, at the very start of, I think. I'd really like to echo, you know, what Laura and Mick said. Uh, I think they covered those topic, the topic pretty well. But I'd like to add probably the one that uh, I think of most often is synthetic biology. Uh, it holds the greatest promise. It's a, a sort of emerging science, and but it holds significant promise to be able to do things like fuel the point of need manufacturing to address logistics challenges that go along with uh, uh, any sort of tactical operation. But it, it has the uh, ability to cover so many, go in so many different directions from materials to sensing modalities to uh, even into uh, computer processing realm. It, um, and I, I think it, we're just at the beginning of the area where we can, we're really just starting to understand this. How how do we really manage and engineer the genome to really uh, realize downstream processes and downstream materials that are going to be can be used for a myriad of things um, that really kind of uh, I often think of it as sort of the third leg of the, the synthetic uh, molecular synthetic uh, triad, and whether you do your classical stepwise synthetic approaches, or you do uh, things like uh, combinatorial chemistry to get to those new materials, and uh, thirdly, leveraging biological systems to be able to produce things for you. And again, those things could be electronic in nature, they can be optical in nature, they, they, they can be even energetic in, in nature. And I think it really starts to change the way we think about uh, national security and warfare in the sense that um, you can start to do some of those things where you need them, which is significantly different than the way that we've done them traditionally where you produce the materials in the rear and then have to move them forward. So that uh, really gets you into the, the point of need manufacturing and advanced manufacturing, um, which is really important. Mm -hmm. So wars are um, contests of uh, arms and political will, um, but they're also learning laboratories of a kind, both for the forces within as they move, as they back and forth, but also everyone else watching and thinking about the lessons and how they might apply to their own plans for the future. So I'd like to look at the Ukraine war and through that lens. What are the lessons that you have taken from Ukraine? And why don't we go in the same order again? So Laura, what are some of the lessons that you've taken from Ukraine? Um, it's an interesting question. Um, I, mean, I, I know we're talking about future technology, um, but I think two of the big ones that, that came to mind are more human lessons. And, and one is just a reiteration that leadership is so important and that strong institutions matter. Um, I mean, arguably, uh, President Putin has ruined Russia's future. Um, with this decision. And, you know, I'm, I'm very glad that in the United States, we have an experienced president with a good temperament and a really solid team behind him that's been able to navigate a lot of these dangers and a lot of the brinksmanship um, in this conflict. And, um, and I, yeah, I think the administration has done a pretty good job of, of managing that while help, continuing to help Ukraine. I mean, you can imagine though a different personality could have led us in really different and dangerous directions. So just, I think a reiteration that strong democratic institutions are so important and strong civil society institutions are so important. Um, the ability of citizens to dissent pr productively when you have these, if you have a personalist or a narcissistic leader, you know, you end up with an information bubble. Yes, yes and no men, they personalize conflict. I think that increases the existential threat 
The other thing that I thought is, was interesting was, you know, in the news in the last few weeks about the role commercial interests have played, you know, specifically um, providing um, communications, broadband internet um, by, by the Starlink system. Um, I certainly hope that as we go forward, we make sure that our decisions are made by people who are accountable to populations and not um, accountable to their companies. Um, you know, not that elected officials always get things right, but that by, by design, they're accountable. So I do think that um, uh, strategically, we really need to think about making sure that, that those things are in place. Um, you know, it's it's not a good idea to have commercial entities have that much decision making power. So I think it's a good um, thing to keep an eye on in the future, especially as humans consider moving into space um, with more um, with more resources. We definitely need a strong governance a system that's accountable to people. Mick, uh, you've uh, actually traveled multiple times to Ukraine, and so your observations. Uh, are both as an analyst, but also bringing in some first person side. So what are some of the highlights of what you've learned uh, from Ukraine? Um, thanks, Peter. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of observations we can take. I'm not sure anything yet is a lesson learned. Uh, I think there's some way to go yet. And a lot of institutions are struggling with what they observe in Ukraine and whether it's relevant to them or not, not every lesson might be. But a couple of things I think are important. Firstly, is this notion of the adaptation battle. It's, as you noted, wars are also a learning opportunity. Um, and at every level, whether it's a tactical, operational, strategic or political, there's an adaptation battle going on as each side struggles to gain some kind of, kind of advantage, to learn what's going on, to, to learn how they're learning about the conflict and then constantly change, adapt, and, and evolve. And we've seen both sides adapt and evolve their strategy, their tactics, their equipment, uh, their external um, relationships throughout this war. So I think that's a really important thing. And, and what that says to me is, what is the organizational learning culture of whatever institution you belong to? How do you nurture the foundations for adaptation before you go to war. So uh, if you do find yourself in one and you're not able to deter it, how do you best learn and adapt? I think a second observation would be that there are very few, few very few new things in this war. I mean, this, most wars are an aggregation of, of every idea, every technology and every organization that's gone before it uh, with a couple of new things added. So this, this war features, you know, mass uh, warfare. It features the mobilization of people and industry. It features alliances. It features things like trench warfare and airline combat. But the couple of new things, I think, are portending a change in the character of war, uh, be they the mass influence and mass autonomous systems that are being deployed, the ability to gain and sustain uh, awareness in the battlefield to a degree we haven't before. It's not transparency and it's not always wisdom, but it's certainly visibility. And what I think that drives, and I think the Ukrainian offensive in the South is a great case study of this, is that many of the ideas, the doctrines and the organizations that we think work in modern warfare are actually half a century old uh, and we need to evolve them, expecting the Ukrainians to breach through minefields with technology that's 50 years old, doctrine that's 70 years old, and an environment where, you know, you can be seen and brought under fire in minutes was an intellectual failure on the part of NATO and the West. And we can't afford to have those kind of intellectual failures in the future. So, so I mean, the lesson is new ideas and new organisations need to be layered over the top of many of the old aspects of what we're seeing in this war. And there's some pretty careful judgments that will need to be made about that. Troy. Uh I think Laura and Mick again really hit this uh, pretty pretty well. I would probably reshape the question slightly different and bring in a, a couple of other um, um, events that happened, Nagorno-Karabakh and, and also uh, dating back to uh, 2020, uh, Libya. Um, and, and what I take, a, take from those uh, classrooms as it were is this idea of attributable systems. I think we are now in a, a new uh, realm where attributable systems will become more and more important. Uh, historically, if you look back, um, the way that we uh, typically have prosecuted 
war, we had exquisite systems that we protected at all costs, whether you think about this as an uh, uh, aircraft craft carrier or a, a tank or what have you, those are certain systems that we really tried to protect. I think we are in a different realm now where we have systems that are, to some degree, uh, have some disposability and are, are able to uh, work collaboratively with other systems and the, and the ensemble, the network, continues to work even if you lose some. So this whole idea of attributable systems and graceful degradation, I think, are, are really big um, building blocks that we can leverage as we move forward. And I, I think as we, um, from the work that my office does, there are significant um, investments in science and technology, not only in the U.S., but around the globe that are starting to move in that direction to be able to realize attributable systems, whether they're uh, aerial systems or ground systems or uh, sea systems that um, you, you have uh, many of them. They're, none of them are as expensive as the, your exquisite system. And so you can lose some of them. And if they're designed in a proper way and integrated properly, then you can, can have the ability to still have collaboration at scale or swarming or things like that and still prosecute the mission while losing a few of the elements that you are, are would leverage to do that. So. Th these are all great points, and I think in many ways um, it's important to think about the, the difference in the phrasing of, in the U.S. context, we say lessons learned, but in, for example, the British military and others, and maybe Australia, there's the lessons observed, which yep. means, you know, I didn't actually... Um, a lot of these, the question really is, will we implement them in our systems? And actually, we were having a conversation out in the hallway um, related to your last point, Troy, of, you know, you've got an example of the launch of uh, the replicator initiative, but what would it look like? Does it get funded? What's its scale? You know, so we've, uh, we've observed lessons, but will we actually implement is um, open-ended right now. Um, so with that, I... Uh, um, I'm someone, uh, I'm a worry wart. So uh, make my life worse. Um, what worries you the most when you peer into the future? Uh, so Laura, and you, you have a responsibility. I mean, look, you literally, it's the concerned scientist. So it's not just what concerns the scientist, but what worries you personally the most about the future of technology and conflict? Okay. Um, yeah, a professional concerned person. Um, well, I am definitely concerned about the future. Um, and it sometimes it feels like the future is coming faster than you imagine. I mean, looking looking out at the storms that have just happened this past week, the, the climate emergency is upon us. And um, we're seeing enormous disruption. Um, we're going to see misery for our most vulnerable, and it's going to come for everyone if, if we don't really do a better job of grappling with this. And that is going to cre inc create incredible pressures with mass migrations. Economic systems are going to be more fragile. So just the, the context for conflict, I think, will be, um, you know, the pressure is ratcheted up as, you know, um, pandemics and wars. Um, uh, of course, um, I spend most of my time thinking about nuclear weapons issues, and and that is a central concern for me, of course, because we have such a hard time grappling with low risk and high consequence events. Um, and at times in our history, we've our guiding principle has been trying to how do we decenter these weapons, which can not only kill hundreds of millions of people almost immediately, but could threaten billions with climate and economic disruption. Um, but they're, again, being centered. Um, we have uh, the fraying of arms control agreements and the destruction of that whole um, edifice that has been our been guide rails for decades. Um, we are uh, all, almost all of the nuclear weapons powers are refurbishing and expanding their nuclear arsenals and creating new delivery systems, bespoke delivery systems, trying to finesse um, deterrence and increasing the different types of um, weapons that can be used. We're building um, more and more ships with missiles. Now we can do intermediate range missiles and anti-missile systems, and they're going to be uh, moving in the same spaces, uh, increasing um, the, the, the um, supporting technologies like um, 
using space more more in depth with all of these technologies proliferating um, them and in, you know uh, inviting anti-satellite weapon um, development again providing another a uh, short tempo use it or lose it type of pressure so I I I I think I guess the question is what what are the things we should be doing right now that we wish we had the in 10 years we wish we had the guts to do and some of those things so I, I'd like that part to be part of the question which how should we be thinking about the future and what are we supposed to be doing right now to to ensure that that looks as good as possible awesome so Mick um you've actually played in in both these realms of um thinking about the future, how do we adjust to it? But you've also, in a recent book, White Sun War, painted um, one of those scenarios that's quite scary. What would a war uh, in the Pacific look like? So for you personally, um, what do you worry the most? And then let's, let's take um, insight from Laura. What's something we can do to keep your worry from coming true? I think my main one is we don't take seriously the the idea that a the major war could could emerge in the 21st century. I think in the lead up to uh, the war in Ukraine, there were, there were a lot of countries and a lot of politicians who didn't take seriously the fact that there are still people out there who think large wars are a, a valid option in the 21st century to achieve their national uh, priorities. And I think that if we just assume that Xi or people like him are rational actors and would never go to war, it makes our life more difficult in deterring them. So we need to take it seriously, which means you need to take seriously uh, your, your deterrence framework because no one wants this to happen. You know, the kind of catastrophe I painted in White Sub War is what I'm trying to prevent. Um, and it's what we should all be trying to prevent. So in some respects, it's an anti-war novel. And if it's read that way, that that's wonderful. So we need to take seriously the fact that large-scale war is still possible. Or theories just aren't true. Humans for 5,000 years have fought and are probably going to fought, fight again in the future. And therefore, we need to invest in deterrence. But we also need to uh, invest in the kind of uh, dialogues that uh, we're seeing the PLA issue at the moment to ensure that there are guide rails and uh, things don't escalate uh, unnecessarily between uh, potential belligerents. Troy. I'd say that perhaps, uh, I'd like to say my, my colleagues here have hit a lot of the points I, I would have hit, but there's uh, a weapon system that is emergent, um, specifically hypersonic weapons um, give me pause. Um, and I think of them, th th there are um, three levels of threat. First, speed. We're talking about systems that go at a minimum, Mach 5. That's 3,800 miles an hour or faster, combined with the ability to uh, maneuver, which sets them apart from uh, intercontinental uh, ballistic missiles, which also pro go about that fast, but they really... ICBMs uh, travel in a, a, a parabolic uh, trajectory, whereas uh, hypersonic systems are maneuverable and can change direction. And thirdly, uh, one, when they get above about Mach 7 in an oxygen atmosphere, you have ionization of oxygen, um, which a concaminally goes along, um, uh, applies to them this cloak uh, that makes it difficult to be able to sense them. Um, so you can't get, uh, say, an active radar beam through because the, the plasma cloak that surrounds the, the system makes it invisible to radar. So you have a system that's f traveling nearly 4,000 miles, miles an hour, can maneuver, and is hard to detect. Uh, and if you could get that to operate in a collaborative way, that is a, a very um, uh, stark system to contend with. And, and to Laura's point, that um, been demonstrated these types of systems can not only uh, carry uh, conventional uh, warheads, but also nuclear warheads. So that is really a, um, a uh, significant challenge. I'd say that uh, the th after thinking about this a while, I think the thing that um, the biggest bang for the buck would probably be in sensing. 
is there a way that we can be able to uh, be able to uh, efficiently sense these systems? Um, because that's really the first step in the, the kill chain to be able to know where the system is in order to be able to counter it. So uh, I think that's where the initially where most of the, the investment and focus on. Be. Awesome. So I think we've got time for uh, a question from the audience. Uh, so if you've got a question, go ahead and um, raise your hand, actually right there in the back, and quickly introduce yourself as well. Hi, uh, I'm Bridget. I'm the program manager for our cybersecurity uh, fellowship here at New America. Um, this is not my area of expertise, but this is something that I've been curious about since my graduate studies. Um, so in the past few years, as kind of Laura touched on, um, we've seen private companies or the private sector kind of wade its way into military operations via technology. So I'd just be interested to hear from you about how that would impact military planning operations innovation. Thanks. Great. So um, let's see. Uh, actually, Laura, why don't you weigh in? I'm going to put you on point on that. But um, uh, also, uh, as well, then we'll go in the same order. So sure. you mentioned, one, the, the problem of having a, um, uh, uh, what adjective to use, mercurial, uh, would be a, a, a mercurial multi-billionaire um, have control over a communications network. Um, what, what else, when we think about the role of the private sector in conflict via technology, is a point of concern? Boy, that's a really good question, Bridget, and I'm interested to hear what my co-panelists say. Um, I think, of course, the other place where the center of gravity is in the commercial space is in AI, um, and they have enormous resources there. Um, and, uh, you know, it's challenging to self-regulate, um, and especially for technologies that are, that are moving so quickly and are um, inherently sophisticated and difficult to understand. Um, I think commercial space is a little bit easier because it, it, it's sort of more obvious what it does and how it does it. And it's a matter of investing and innovating and engineering really. But I th feel like the AI is a is an edge um, and it could be used to produce as my, as um, Dr. Alexander said, you know, their new novel biological synthetics. It may be great at quickly um, creating new materials that, that could transform industry such as um, uh, room temperature superconductors. So we, we had a tantalizing view of that earlier this year that that could happen. So um, uh, I think, you know, when the center of gravity kind of moves in the commercial space, um, those partnerships with government really have to be in place. So Mick, what um, lessons have you taken in terms of the role of the private sector uh, related to conflict? Well, I think it works both ways. It can work for us, but potentially can, can work against us. I mean, we've seen this meshing of civil and military sensors and analytical capability uh, throughout the war in Ukraine. And whether it's uh, using NASA firms or microphones on, on smartphones to track missiles, you know, we've seen this in deeper integration of military and civilian and government uh, collection frameworks. Now, I think there might be some interesting uh, interpretations in law about the participations of civilians in conflict. At some point, we're probably not there yet. But just as we've used it to, to find targets, to do analysis, uh, to do battle damage assessment, so might a future adversary use it better than what the Russians have had done. So we, we need to be prepared for that environment where all sources can be meshed and used by an adversary against us, not the traditional military and government sources of information and analysis. Troy. Um, I, I think there's an area that, that I always give me a little concern, and that's uh, electronic components. Um, so, you know, when, when you think about electronic components, uh, integrated circuits and, and things like that, we often uh, acquire them, and we integrate them into systems, but understanding where they originated and who actually made it made them um, is has been a challenge because there really are no secure foundries that I'm aware of that have the ability, have the throughput to really kind of fuel uh, the major uh, militaries in, uh, around the globe. 
and to, to, to pull that thread a little bit for you, Bridget, uh, is that when those components are made, they may be made by someone with nefarious intent that put components on board that can be engaged, turned off through uh, a backdoor through cyber connectivity uh, that really could co compromise the final systems that are based around them. Um, so really, I, I, I guess a mitigant would be, could we really kind of envision uh, the development of a secure foundry or an ecosystem of secure foundries that would allow us to make those components that we could we would then use to to build the, the systems that we we leverage and so that's a where I, I i think there's this kind of interplay between the um uh, industry and really kind of national security that you we, we have to navigate there um really you know, industry has been the, the real player there because we, we really just acquire those components and then integrate them. And then we, we trust that they are, are not, that they're sort of clean and pristine mm -hmm. and nothing hidden there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So like so many of the other discussions here, um, we could go on and on, but <laughs> we actually have to uh, come to a closing point. So I want to thank um, all of you uh, for sharing your insights. And so please join me in a round of applause.